Now, whether it's a board game or an electronic game or a TV show, I don't like games that make me feel stupid, generally. Trivial Pursuit, hate that game. Oh, my word, it makes me feel so stupid. Now, I do like Jeopardy, but it also makes me feel stupid. I mean, if I can just get one answer right, I'm happy camper, you know. Uh, and some TV shows, they at least give the average person a chance. My father, when he was alive, he loved Wheel of Fortune. I'm not sure if it was because of Vanna White or he liked word games, but he loved Wheel of Fortune. Uh, and one of my favorite categories is the before and after category from that game. You know, they'll string some letters and words along that if you say them all at the same time, they don't sound right. But if you separate it to the before and after, it does. So here's one. Beauty and the Beast of Burden. Beauty and the Beast, Beast of Burden. Alexander the Great Britain. Beauty Mark of Zorro. And my favorite from this one, America's Next Top Model Train Set. <laughs> Today's gospel reading has a before and after also. Now we're talking about the Palm Sunday, which also called the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem. For our first before, I want to take you back about 200 years or so before Christ came to this earth and was born in a manger, before this Palm Sunday. To the time between the Testaments. Did you know that there was 400 years between the last book of the Old Testament and the first of the New Testament? And, and it was a time of darkness because God hadn't sent any prophet for 400 years. That's almost like twice as long as America's been around. No prophet sent to Israel with the Word of God. And during this time, the city of Jerusalem, just like in the Old Testament, would be besieged by enemies and would be captured Attack after attack. One of the attackers that conquered this region was Alexander the Great. He captured all of Judea. But now Alexander the Great, he allowed the Israelites to continue to worship as they had been worshiping. He did not interfere with their worship styles. And they, this was, you know, not a great thing to be conquered, but at least you could carry on in your religion. And so it was after Alexander died in the year 323 B.C. that they took all the lands he had conquered and they divided it up between his four main generals. Unfortunately, the general who got Jerusalem and the surrounding area was a Seleucid and the Seleucids did not like the Israelites. As a matter of fact, they said it's illegal to own a copy of the, uh, the scriptures, which was to us the Old Testament. Totally outlawed it. And to make it worse, the Seleucid uh, leader named Antiochus IV Epiphanes, he caused a revolt with the Judean people. He put a statue, a statue of Zeus in the temple court. He sacrificed a pig on the altar. That's an unclean animal, Jews. This was highly, highly inflammatory. And then he wanted to make the priest of the Hebrew nation worship these false gods. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how the Israelites felt? Imagine this that a foreign country takes over America. And they come in here and they rip out all the crosses out of Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. They bust every stained glass window that has anything to do with Christ. And then they bring in one of their false gods and say, We have to worship that now. Can you imagine a statue of Muhammad or Buddha or something else like that in the sanctuary here? Can you imagine then how angry the Israelites were? that this happened in their temple by the solutions. It was in 163 B.C. that a man said, I've had enough. I can't take this anymore. He was called the Hammer. He was Judah Maccabee, sometimes called Judas Maccabee. He just really upset about the fact that they'd been conquered, first of all. And then for them to do that in the temple. So he rallied a bunch of Jewish men in. He got himself a small army up. And in 163, he came riding in with his stallion and shouted. And people were waving palm branches just like they did on this Palm Sunday. And they were saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord for Judah Maccabee. Because they were looking for this warrior to clean out the solutions and restore the temple. Which he did. He was able to win that battle. He was able to clean out the temple. He restored the proper worship in the temple. They remember him to this day in the Jewish communities. They celebrate eight days of the Festival of Lights. We also, you've heard of it called Hanukkah, to celebrate the accomplishment of he set up a menorah in there and it was lit. 
However, he was not the Savior. He was not the Messiah. And in a following battle, he was killed and buried. So let's take our before picture of Palm Sunday a little closer to the time of the life of Jesus here on earth. The year 63 B.C., the Roman Empire now has established control of the region around Jerusalem. So the Israelites were once again a conquered people. And the Roman soldiers, they knew the history. They knew about Judah Maccabees. They knew that when the Israelites came to celebrate the Passover, there could be trouble. So they were on their guard. They were looking out for any threats from the Hebrews against the empire. So on this Palm Sunday, Jesus knew he was walking a dangerous path. He knew the history. He knew that these guards were going to be on guard for him and ready for him and looking for anything that happened. And, and they too were shouting again, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. The Jews knew these words. These words are found in Psalm 118. And these words were used at two major Jewish festivals. And it was to celebrate the fact that God had freed them from slavery in Egypt. You remember the Ten Commandments. You remember, you remember before that and, and when uh, the plagues came on the people. And so the prayer was a prayer for freedom at both of these festivals. And the prayer would, that he would act again in a mighty way. God, come back like you did when we were slaves in Egypt. We want to have plagues. We want pillars of fire. We want smoke. We want a parting of the sea again. We want miraculous food in the desert. We want water from a rock. We want to be free again. So in Jesus' day, this was a fervent prayer for freedom from the Romans. Freedom from crippling taxes, freedom from oppression. Pastor David Tyler in his sermon, When the Cheering Stops, has some good insights on the uh, before of the people of Jerusalem. What were the people who waved palm branches thinking what were the people who weigh palm branches hoping for? What were they expecting when Jesus came in to celebrate the Passover? He goes on to say, The Jews found themselves under heavy Roman oppression. There were heavy taxes, restrictions, numerous executions by means of crucifixion. The Jews were searching for someone to deliver them from this. They wanted a king. They wanted a, another Judah Maccabee, but one who would stay in command. They wanted somebody who could work mighty works. And, and they had seen Jesus. He had been ministering for three years, and they knew that he could restore sight to the blind. They had seen him heal the lame. They saw him feed the multitude with a little boy's little sack lunch. And they saw that he had raised from the dead Lazarus. Can you imagine now a warrior king who when his soldiers are killed, he can just go over there and raise them from the dead? What a mighty army he could lead. He would be the one, and they wanted this Jesus to be the king. And that's what they were expecting before Palm Sunday. So in the Palm Sunday before, what was Jesus doing? Jesus was casting out demons and healing the sick. On his way to Jerusalem, Jesus stopped. He stopped by ten lepers. And you know, leprosy is just a horrible disease that just takes over the body. And uh, they stood at a distance, it says, and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They stood at a distance because they were not considered just sick. They were considered unclean. Unclean. Now, if you're a good Jewish person, you can't touch anything unclean. Because it says one of the consequences of that is that you were set apart from the community. You were cast out for a certain period of time. But if you had leprosy, that's it. You're done. You are done with people. You are on your own out in small bands of, of, other, uh, of other lepers. Uh, I can imagine now what it must have been like to be totally devoid of human contact. In Luke chapter 5, he tells us of another time that Jesus met a leper. And scripture says that when he was in one of the cities, a man full of leprosy came to him. When he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Listen to the response now. What happened? And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Now, if you get focused in on Jesus healing 
that leper, you might miss something critically important. It says, when he said, would you heal me? He says, he reached out and touched him. An unclean, unhealed, leprous person, Jesus the Messiah, touched him. We don't know how long it had been since he had had human contact. But Jesus, in his compassion, touched him. He stretched out his hand and touched him with a hand of concern, a hand of friendship, a hand of caring, a hand of compassion, and a hand of healing. Also, before Palm Sunday, Jesus was preaching and teaching. Teaching on tithing and paying taxes. He was teaching on worry and priorities. He was teaching on temptation and forgiveness. He was teaching on divorce and sexual purity. And Jesus taught about the cost of being a disciple. You see, part of the cost of being a disciple is that we don't get to live life our way anymore. But we want to follow the way that Jesus taught. So Jesus rode into Jerusalem, not on a stallion like Maccabees, but on a donkey, a colt. And the people were waving their palm branches, and they were shouting, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And they were cheering, and they were praising, and they were exalting. And then something happened. The cheering stopped for Jesus. Now we've seen the before of Palm Sunday, but what about the after for Jesus? What about the after Palm Sunday? Jesus didn't gather any troops. He didn't lead a revolt. He did not do what the people expected him to do. Instead, Luke and Mark tell us that Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple after coming in. Let me tell you a little bit more. Mark, I think, has a more clear story of what happened in uh, verse chapter 11. And they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house should be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. A den of thieves. The disciples remembered. Oh, and by the way, this is another thing that really ticked off the Pharisees. And the, and the priests, they really were determined now to get this Jesus gone. And they would within a week. The disciples remember that scripture that says he was consumed with zeal for God's house. So the question of the day is, what is your before and after? Where's your zeal? Not your before and after you became a Christian, but before and after following Christ. I misspoke that. I meant to say not your before and after Palm Sunday, but your before and after following Christ. And the Bible's clear because I was really hesitant to bring up a before and after because, you know, once we become a Christian, our before really doesn't count anymore. It's very clear that sins we committed before Christ are totally gone and washed away. Psalm 103, 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Amen. Romans 4. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Colossians from Paul also. He delivered us from the domain of darkness. I like that one. He delivered us from the domain of darkness. And the last one I want to share with you, and there's tons more. Acts 13. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed. Now, this is not the kind of freedom that the Israelites were looking for on Palm Sunday, but it's the kind of freedom they needed. It's the kind of freedom that we need today. So the before I'm asking you about is not the sins committed before, but the before that you carry with you always. We always have before and after with us. St. Paul calls the before the old Adam, the old sin nature, the flesh. Even though we have found forgiveness through faith in Jesus Christ, our before wants to drag us back into a lifestyle that separates us from God. 
in Galatians 5 and in some other places, St. Paul talks about some of the before lifestyles. 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. Now notice that Paul doesn't specify what type of sexual immorality here. He kind of takes and clumps these all together. He includes it all. Now some people might think, well, homosexuality, that's the worst one. That's got to be the bad one. Single people might think, well, adultery is when married people cheat on each other. But Paul and Scripture are clear. Any sex outside the bonds of marriage of a man and a woman separate us from God. And there are dire consequences. Let's keep reading some other types of sin that Paul warns against. Idolatry, anything we put before God. Sorcery, I just read the horoscopes for fun. <laughs> Okay, look, I used to be pretty radical. When I'd eat down at Sticks, I wouldn't even open the little cookie and read it now, but I've lightened up a little bit because I found out those things are so far from being sorcery. They're a joke. Uh, but they're fun sometimes. But we've got to be careful. I mean, Ouija boards as a kid. I did not know that was, you know, getting me into the realm of what God said don't do. I was just a kid. And there's another whole group stretched together. I like these when he puts them all together. Um, Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, and divisions. I used to work with a guy who loved to stir stuff up and keep people aggravated with each other. You ever work with somebody like that? Most of us have at one point or another know that person, that guy or that gal that loves to stir it up. And God says that's not what we're supposed to be doing. Especially in church, we're not supposed to be stirring stuff up and causing divisions. Oh, and then he goes on to another one. I don't want to get personal here, but guess what? Drunkenness separates us from God. Now, as Christians, as Lutheran Christians, we know we have the freedom after cutting grass to have a couple of beers, and it's okay. But it's a slippery slope between having one or two to having 10 or 12 to becoming a drunk. And he says, we've got to be careful about that. What does uh, he say about this? Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. What does that mean? What does it mean? Not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a real nice way of saying they will burn in hell forever. I know, I know. It's not cool to talk about hell in America anymore, is it? It's just not a cool thing. But you know what's not cool? Not cool is letting someone live a lifestyle that separates them from God forever without trying to warn them about it in a loving way. In a loving way is the key here. Caring about them. Because there are eternal consequences. St. Paul goes on to encourage us, to encourage us to live in the after. The after is referred to as the new Adam. You know, walking with the Spirit. It says uh, in 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And I, when I was a kid, we had a phrase in youth group. It was walk the, come on, walk the, walk the talk. You're going to talk the talk, you better walk the walk. And it comes from this verse, keep in step with the Spirit. What? Did I say that right? If you're going to talk the talk, you better walk the walk. You know, I can't hit the rewind button, so I'll just forget I said that. <laughs> I'm good, I'm glad you're with me. Uh, but now when Paul talks about walking the talk, he said, here's some ways you can do that. Here's what uh, an after a lifestyle will look like. The fruit of the Spirit is love. I love that he put love first. And don't we misuse that word? I mean, really. Love should be reserved for our love for God, my love for my wife, my love for my kids. But man, when we changed garbage deliveries and they brought me a big old can with big wheels, I loved my new garbage can. I have abused this word so much. <sighs> love. Real love. A sacrificial love and joy. Man, if you're a Christian, if you're a forgiven child of God, there's no need to be walking around like a push all the time. Joy, peace. Don't be like that guy that's stirring up trouble. Have peace in your life. Patience. Okay, let's skip that one. Let's go. Yeah. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness. Self-control. Against such thing there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. I'll close with a story about 
Manfred von Richthofen. Maybe you know who that is. He was a fam famous German World War I fighter pilot. He was better known as the Red Baron. That's right. Because he flew a distinctive red triplane. And he had shot down more enemy aircraft than anybody else in the war. He's credited with like 80 kills, 80 aircraft shot down. But on April 21st of 1918, he began chasing a Canadian plane. And he's after this Canadian, and he's determined to make kill number 81. And so the Canadian, knowing who this was behind him, tries to fly out. And he's trying to fly back to Allied territory, flying to get back to home base. And they're, they're flying over the Moulin Rouge court. And as the Red Baron pursued him, he did stray in. He did chase him in behind Allied lines. And now the Red Baron is in his enemy's territory. And he didn't notice because he was so focused on this plane that he wanted to shoot down that another Canadian had gotten in behind him. Another Canadian who came in and was ready to shoot him down, Roy Brown. Now we're not sure whether it was ground fire or Roy Brown that got him down, but we know that that was the Red Baron's last flight. We know that the Red Baron came to his end because he made the mistake of pursuing an Allied plane, as one report says, too long, too far, and too low into enemy territory. The moral of the story is that many committed Christians have been shot down because they followed temptation too long, too far, and too low into enemy territory. And as with the Red Baron, are caught by the enemy and then have to deal with the eternal consequences. You see, guys, today, we're the lepers. We are unclean. And yet Jesus still reaches out to us with his nail-scarred hand of compassion, offering us a chance to live in the after and the hereafter. And in just a few short days from Palm Sunday, Jesus, hanging in agony on that cross, will look up to heaven and say about us, Father, forgive them. They just don't know what they're doing. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your love and grace. We thank you that we can live in the after. That the before, even though it, it tags with us and it hangs around us and it tries to bring us down, your Holy Spirit gives us the power to live those fruits of the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name, amen.